Hi everyone, welcome back. My name is Amanda Gold and today I'm joined by Anthony Wallen, a medical director for urgent care here at Intermountain Healthcare to talk about testing. A lot has happened in the last couple of weeks in the state of Utah. We've seen an uptick in cases and we've seen our testing volumes really increase. So today we're gonna talk about the process for testing, how to get your results and really what, what's going on right now. So Tony, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate the time. Thanks, Amanda. I'm happy to be here. Yes, and it's nice to talk to you again. The first thing I want to talk about is a little bit about your role and what that has to do specifically with testing and how you kind of got involved with testing once this pandemic began. Yeah, so I'm the urgent care medical director. So we have all our Instacares and Kids Cares throughout the state, uh, and it really smattered all over the state. So um, when we started this pandemic, uh, the system came to me and said, hey, it seems best that we uh, are able to test throughout our whole state. And since we have clinics that are open extended hours, weekends, holidays, and we have the staff that's trained in swabbing and doing these kinds of tests, since we do these kinds of tests regularly all year round, uh, it made sense that the, the urgent care system would be the, the system that, that took on this role for curbside testing, et cetera. Yeah, you mentioned before we started that curbside testing has been a, uh, or testing has been a thing for a while with flu season and other things like that too. We've also had a lot of changes with testing over the last couple of months. At the beginning of this in March, testing, you had to have more of the symptoms in order to get tested. Can you update us on who qualifies for testing now that we're kind of in the thick of everything that's going on? Yeah, I will say that that, uh, algorithm changes mm -hmm. all the time. It's not uncommon to change it on a weekly or you know every other week basis. So uh, the message really is is to really split this up into symptomatic and asymptomatic, meaning no symptoms. So if you have symptoms, uh, common cold symptoms, sore throat, cough, fever, body aches, short of breath, you lo lose your sense of smell, even things like diarrhea may qualify. It depends on what your other symptoms are. So if you're symptomatic, we still recommend getting a test. It allows us to identify the virus in our community, but it also allows us to do contact tracing. The contact tracing then becomes asymptomatic patients, right? People without symptoms yet. That gets way more complex. And um, we do uh, pre-delivery on laboring mothers we do pre-procedural you know before surgery that you do you qualify for a test for that we do um, testing on patients in skilled nursing facilities jail mm -hmm. um, those kinds of facilities we also do testing on um, uh, asymptomatic that we are guided by the state to do infectious disease will call and say these are the this is a group that we're going to test they may want to do it for epidemiologic purposes the best way to do that for the general public is to call our COVID hotline and get direction on do i qualify for a test or not we have a we have a limited resource right in testing so we do the tests that are of highest yield and give us most information. If we just tested everybody, lots of asymptomatic patients, you get such a low yield, you're using your resource unwisely. Yeah, I think that's good to note that the qualifications change and they can, and they probably will continue to change as this kind of goes on. So that COVID hotline is really important for people and I'll give that at the end. Um, you also mentioned contact tracing. Is the state doing that or is Intermountain involved in calling people that you've had close contact with? And will you explain a little bit more what contact tracing is for yeah. people too? Yeah, so contact tracing is just that. If you come in contact with a known positive COVID patient, they're known to be positive. So the, the criteria is within six feet of coming in contact with that patient uh, for 10 minutes or more. Mm -hmm. If you are a known contact with those criteria, then we'd want to test, right? To see if you have contracted that virus. But you can see how this goes. You could, how many levels of contact do we want to test because the yield goes down with each level. So that's why we choose that level, the closest contacts. So that's what contact tracing is, is to, is to find those, those patients and then 
isolate them, right? We want to get people that have this virus isolated. Um, the state has historically been doing this, the health, the local health departments, the state health department, they're, because of our increase in prevalence of this virus in the last four weeks, they're having more difficulty doing that. We okay. have helped them with that some. We also not only help them with making those phone calls to contact trace, but, uh, and uh, mostly we want them to be doing that we do the testing at curbside for those. So the Utah Health Department and the local health departments do send those patients to us to be swabbed at the curbside and then use our lab for the testing. With contact tracing too, is there a waiting period once you are called by the state for when you should actually go get tested? Yeah, good point. If you test too early in that contact, say you were contacted, yet you came in contact with a positive yesterday, it, the likelihood of your test being positive is very low. Mm -hmm. So the recommendation is to do it somewhere in that second week, seven to 14 day period is the best timing right now from what we know of this virus. So let's talk about where I should get testing. I know that we have testing locations throughout the state like you mentioned, where are those? Where can I get tested? And also what do I need to know before I actually show up to get my tests done? So we have 25 test curbside swabbing sites. Let's mm -hmm. let's uh, be clear on that. We don't test at the site. We send the lab. We send the specimen to the lab. We have 25 of those. The very best way to do this to keep us so that we can keep the wait times down is to do the COVID hotline. If you have symptoms or you're questioning whether you need to have a test because of a contact, you call the COVID hotline. There may be wait times because they're they're quite busy right now because of the prevalence has gone up so much in our state. But the best way to do that is call the COVID hotline and let them determine if you need a test. They will order the test in our system and they will give you instructions on what to do then. And they usually will send you to the closest curbside site. They'll give you the hours that, that are open and you will be swabbed uh, from that curbside site. Two quick questions about that. If you don't have a car, can you still get tested? And then if you don't have a phone, because this actually happened, someone didn't have the ability to call the hotline, can you just show up? Yes, we. so realistically, we do that quite often during the day. That's what's causing some of our longer wait times is when somebody shows up without a order mm -hmm. and hasn't called the COVID hotline, but we still do it. So you can walk up, you can bike up, you can drive up, you can scooter up. We we do all of that. We have, uh, ways, uh, chairs, etc. We have places for people to wait uh, so that they can get the, the swabbing done. Uh, any way that uh, and any way they come is okay with us. That's good to know. We also just had a, a question come in on Facebook. Uh, someone wants to know if they're subject to nosebleeds, if there's a way to get tested besides the nose swab. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, if they're susceptible to nosebleeds, um, we would still recommend they get a nasopharyngeal swab. What we're doing right now is we are in the process with the lab of validating other methods of that you've probably heard about around mm -hmm. the country that doesn't require a, a full nasopharyngeal swab, but it may require a nasal swab. Um, but they, they actually self-collect that, the patient in front of us, and do a saliva sample. We're uh, in the process of validating those so that that might be a better way to go. There's another uh, option, and that is an antigen test that we're working on and more to come on how we collect for that. But otherwise, right now, the, the best way to do that is still a nasopharyngeal swab. We haven't had much in the way of problems with these kinds of things like nose, nosebleeds. Uh, very small swabs that we use. The nasopharyngeal swab is not your normal Q-tip swab. It's very small, thin, and all of the the caregivers are trained on how to do this appropriately. So what actually happens when you go to get tested? When you basically from that first phone call of calling the COVID hotline, what happens when you arrive? How long does the test actually take? Um, and then how long are you typically there? Uh, I know that's hard to say because the volumes have been up, but a typical timeline. Typical timeline, I, I would say plan at least an hour or two <laughs> when you get there at this point because of the prevalence. It's been much lower than that, you know, a month ago. Mm -hmm. um, when you arrive, there'll be signs that tell you what to do. It's usually a phone call, actually. Um, there's usually a greeter or a traffic person that helps with the coordinating this, but usually you call in and get registered so that we can 
if you don't have an order, we can get that order in. And then you wait. And when you do get up to the to be swabbed, they'll they'll walk you through what they're going to do with the nasopharyngeal swab because it, it is a little bit of an alarming process and it stays in the back of your nose for at least 10 seconds. And uh, it makes your eyes water and it's uncomfortable. But after that, they give you some instructions to hand out on what it is that you should expect, um, some instructions on what to do at home, isolate, especially if you have symptoms, et cetera. And the, the turnaround time right now, as of today, 90% of our patients are getting results back within about 60 hours. Okay. Um, our goal is 72 hours, three days, you know, but uh, uh, that varies some, so 10% of them are, at, are longer than that. The, I can tell you that once you're swabbed, your swab will then get sent day of to the lab and be prioritized. Most of our curbside tests and swabs are prioritized in a lower priority, five through nine instead of one through four. The one through four are, are really prioritized priority high because they're hospitalized patients. They need to have an emergent appendectomy, that sort of thing. There's a few, there's a little bit of resource for rapid testing at the lab, and they leave that for very critically ill patients. Because I'm assuming if you do have a surgery or something, they're, they're going to want to know if you're positive to take proper precautions for that patient. So that's emergency surgery. If they are positive, they'll probably wear more PPE as opposed to less if you're negative. Is that correct? Yeah, and it also helps. You are correct, but it also helps to know if, you're, if this patient is positive post-operation, et okay. cetera. Yeah, you got to know what you're dealing with throughout the, their course when they're in the hospital and they're critically ill. And that might change the way that a treatment is potentially done too, I'm assuming, as well. Correct. Most of our curbside testing is is on pre-ops is is mainly people that are not critically ill. Mm -hmm. We're doing it so that we can use less PPE during that procedure. And then we also know whether we should even do that. It might be an elective procedure. Why do it if you have COVID? That so we sense. are doing that as well. We just got another question too. Um, someone who wrote in said that she's positive for COVID-19 and has five kids. Should she go take her children to get tested or should they all just self-isolate? That's a great question. We've been, we've been discussing this um, at length in the last week. I can tell you when we talk to the health department, state health department, local health departments about that, they are at this point recommending and we are now recommending that if you have somebody that's positive in your house and you have five other people living with you, really not necessary to get everybody tested. Mm -hmm. It's probably necessary at that point to quarantine everybody and act like everybody does have the virus. Especially kids, I don't know how old these people are, but it, it could make it a little bit trickier. Um, and on that note of kids too, does, it, does testing work any differently with children? Is there a recommended age that they don't get tested? How does that work? No, we, we test all ages. Okay. I can tell you that we do recommend for, at Intermountain at least, that if you, if you have a child under age two, that they get a visit, either a virtual visit or in-person visit with their pediatrician or other provider before they go through the COVID hotline swab. We'd rather have their pediatrician order that test after interviewing them, possibly even examining them. Under two gets interesting when it comes to respiratory distress in kids and how quickly they can get sick. Mm -hmm. So we don't, if you walked up to our curbside with an under two year old that doesn't have an order in, we recommend they get seen okay. first. That's good to know. So once you get tested, um, you get your instructions on what to expect. How do you actually get your results? And you said it typically takes 60 to 72 hours, but how do I find out what my results are? If you're positive, you get a call still, from at least in our system. If, you have, if you're negative, you may not get a call now. We've, we've because of the prevalence, we've mm -hmm. been overloaded with those. So we now give instructions at the curbside on how to sign up for our My Health Plus uh, feature and you can then obtain those results from the My Health Plus uh, app. Um, and if all else fails, you can still call the COVID hotline and there are people that can help answer that question of what your test result is. But we prefer to do it electronically because it's more efficient. 
And if you are positive, I'm assuming that after you get that phone call, those results would still go into My Health Plus too. Is that correct? Absolutely. Okay, so you have a couple of different options on how you can test. And I know that the My Health Plus 2 is a desktop app, so if someone doesn't have access to a phone, they could they could check it that way as well. And if they're not Intermountain, you know, if they have a provider that's not Intermountain, they have insurance that's not Intermountain, they can still sign up for the My Health Plus. That's good to know. And I'll, I'll put those links in afterwards as well. Um, so why is it so important that people actually go get tested? What's if we don't really have a cure and, and they're not going to be hospitalized, what's the purpose of getting tested? A couple reasons. One is to know what ex to expect. Number two is to get very diligent, which we all should do anyway, diligent at being at being quarantining yourself, isolating, reducing the number of contacts to just your household. Um, the other reason is epidemiologic purposes. It allows the state to, to understand what's going on in our community. Um, the other piece is the contact tracing. It allows us to then understand who we need to contact trace, uh, particularly at workplaces, uh, uh, you know, extended care facilities, uh, like I said, uh, uh, high occupancy buildings, that sort of thing. So getting tested, especially if you're symptomatic, is helpful for that. That's good to know. And I think it's important to that with everything that's happened in the last couple of weeks, they've been able with contact tracing and testing, say, hey, this person got COVID-19 most likely from this event. So that contact tracing, I think, is really important as well. Um, last question for you. What types of volumes are we seeing at the testing sites right now? And how can we help reduce transmission of COVID-19? Right now, it's not uncommon in an eight hour period to swab 250. We've been up to 350 in the last week at some of the sites. We're doing over 3000 swabs a day at our curbside alone. That doesn't include our hospitals and clinics, et cetera. So the volumes are quite, quite high. Um, and sorry, we got two more questions for you. So I'm gonna ask those for you. Um, Someone asked, can you speak to the availability of the supplies necessary to test? And if you're considering pool testing, which I'm not sure what that is. But yeah. Maybe you know what that I is. I do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. This is a this is a high end question here. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent question. Um, yeah, we are considering uh, pool testing. Uh, I don't think it's on our radar right now for the next week or so, but all of those things will come into play possibly as the prevalence gets higher. Um, Right now, um, we have a swab meeting. Mm, it's about three times a week at least. Sometimes okay. it's more if we get lower on our swabs and our resources. So swabs is one piece of resource that we have to watch. Um, it, we are constantly working on what are we going to do for the next two weeks. We're probably we're usually about two weeks ahead of the game with enough swabs, and we're always working. What do we do with the next two weeks? So more to come. And we do keep enough swabs in reserve so that if we get into a larger surge, that we're able to provide those swabs for the critically ill. That's good to know. Yeah. The other question was? The uh, other question was, how can we help reduce transmission of COVID-19? What, what can you and I do to stop the spread of COVID? Um, yeah, excellent question. And uh, it's, it's the basics and it's pretty obvious. Um, you can call it social distancing. I like the term physical distancing. I don't think we should social distance. Social distancing is isolation for mm -hmm. humans, which we don't like. Um, but physical distancing, keeping yourself six feet apart or more, and wearing face coverings and washing hands. Those, if you can remember to do those things often, don't congregate in large numbers with each other. And if you do congregate, the preference would be to be outside because it's all about dose of the virus. Mm -hmm. So if your dose of virus inside because the airspace is small is higher, you have less time to be in that airspace, right? It, you may only have five minutes before your chance of getting that virus goes up. Whereas outside because of the diffusion, you might get 20 minutes with a group before your chance of uh, the risk goes up of, of getting that virus. So we all got to educate ourselves, but uh, I would, probably the biggest thing to ask today is just face coverings, wash hands, don't con congregate in large numbers and try to be outside when you, when you are congregating. And I do know that Salt Lake County and Summit County, there is a mandate now that face coverings are required in all public spaces, indoor and outdoor. Uh, so I think that's important to remember that 
you should have a mask on you wherever you go. Keep it in your purse, keep it in your car, keep it on you uh, just in case you need it. I think that's that's really going to help and that's something that we really need to emphasize is those face coverings make a very big difference um, and they're very important for the community as well. Amanda, I have mine right here. <laughs> yes. It's just right over here. And <laughs> yes, I have out. one in my back <laughs> too. Um, Tony, is there anything else that you want to mention to us today about testing or anything in general? Yeah, I would say... Uh, keep in mind as the prevalence goes up, we're going to have to all be patient and we're going to have to understand that things will change. And so be amenable to those changes. The healthcare uh, uh, facilities and providers are going to have to change how they do things as the, those numbers go up. That's good advice. Tony, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And a couple of phone numbers for you guys really quickly. The COVID-19 hotline is 844-442-5224. And you can call that phone number to find out about if you qualify for testing and get your order placed as well. We also still have our emotional health relief hotline available seven days a week from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. That phone number is 833-442-2211. There's lots of resources on our website too for testing locations, the hours that are going to be available. Those will change, so make sure you check them out before you actually head to the location. Thanks everyone, we'll see you next time.